After reflecting on the last five decades, I've come to realize that I have a story. One of my music and my sound, and the marvelous collaborations with friends and colleagues. With a little help from these friends, I will share with you the journey that has shaped my musical life. I suppose every musician has a story, and my story is not new, but it is mine. Welcome to The Path Taken, hosted by Tom Farley and Alton Riddick. Hello, folks. Good evening. This is uh, Alton Reddick along with Tom Farley. How you doing, Tom? Just fine. Good evening, folks. This is the last installment of The Path Taken. And um, it's been a treat, sir. I want to Before I even get started, I just want to let you know how fun this has been. Because I got a chance to really be particular because I have to listen to all of your songs. And all the little nuggets I pulled out because that's what interested me or something that poked out or all those good moments that you have spent decades putting together. Now, you've been at this for like, can I say 40? Actually, it's closer to 40, 45. That's a long time to do anything. Yeah. E- including living. So, I mean, <laughs> I just want to let you know, man, I appreciate this journey that I, that you've allowed me to take with you it's it's been a treat and um you have a lot of good songs a lot of great songs actually um and i get a little bit reflective because this is the end of this particular part of your you know um public music life as far as the podcast goes and i just want to give out give out a thank you and i know i'm not the only one a lot of people have been part of your career um a lot of people have supported you in your career and uh I just want to let you know, man, from all of us, especially me, because I'm talking to you right now. But uh, thank you. Thank you, sir. Well, you are you are more than welcome. I, I have to, uh, you know, throw some of that back on you. Um, there's not too many people on this planet that have taken an interest, uh, a complete and total interest in uh, uh, the music that I've created or the videos or any of the rest of the stuff that, that's gone on. Uh, at least to the point, not only just sitting back and listening to them, but also uh, to engage in conversations with me about them, to actually have their own insights as to what it means to them that they share with me, uh, to actually point things out to me that I would have never thought somebody else would would consider that uh, I understand can make the music something very, very special. Um, it takes a lot of dedication and a lot of time to do all that, it, to listen to something and, and really be able to uh, focus in on how it really hits you or how you understand it. And then to share that with me and, and be able to, to pull more conversation out of it that, that will allow people who will follow us um, to understand better what the music is all about. I consider that an incredible gift that you've given me, and uh, I will never forget you for that. Uh, the, the whole concept behind um, wanting to hear it from me through somebody whose who's music and, and, and uh, musical opinions and intellect I truly respect uh, without getting it secondhand from somebody else uh, means an awful lot to me. It means a lot to Tanya. It means an awful lot to the other people who are very, very close uh, to what this experience has been the entire time. So I thank you uh, for at least allowing me to have the chance to take the songs that I have, the recording experience, the players, uh, the engineering, all that aspect which we which we share an awful lot in, uh, and be able to uh, to give that to you know this generation, next generation, whatever, to have it as part of uh, an, an analog or not an analog, uh, a catalog of um, what my musical life has been, and uh, I, I I think that's rare but also it is so meaningful in so many different ways. And I've always believed that, you know, why not get it from the horse's mouth? And you've given me that, that, that chance to do that with people. And I am eternally grateful to you for that. Well, sir, you are welcome. You are certainly welcome because it's been a pleasure. Well, let's take the first step and the last installment. Okay. So here we go. This is the place. Writing and production, tell us. Well, um, I, it, 
the first, well, the, the two verses really do have an awful lot of, of difference to them. Um, uh, basically, it starts off by saying it don't mean nothing. Uh, when you think of the places we have seen, Tanya and I, I, I think of that, uh, Tanya and I uh, going through. Uh, we've been through, through an awful lot, and uh, if you can't make it in between, if you can't make it in between the good times and the bad times, if you can't, you know, you know, find solutions and, and hold on to each other and make it through that, then what the hell good are you in terms of, of your relationship and the amount of commitment that you've made to it? Um, so that that was important. But to me, um, uh, when it says, this is a place I want to be every day, uh, some people find that to be kind of boring if, if you're talking about home, but I love being at home. I love being with Tanya and Barry. Uh, COVID, you know, kind of set that in stone. But we, you know, there there are things, there are good things that can come out of that. Uh, things that, uh, that, you know, when it says, this is the place I want to be every day, I, I thought, you know, it was also through the COVID thing, a lot of people working from home, they, they found that working from home was good, that they would understand what that's all about. So you know that uh, that meant an awful lot. the The second verse uh, has to deal with family. Uh, there are certain uh, and, and some friends. Uh, there are certain members of both of our families that are basically, uh, uh, you know, people say that they love you, but they bring you a tremendous amount of pain uh, and you know emotional pain, uh, sometimes mental pain. Uh, and you know, um, so at the end of the song, it says, "I've been thinking about it and." Uh, uh, I'm enjoying the fact that I'll be okay, you know, because uh, I'm never going to really let these people bother me again like they have in the past. And I like that. Uh, I think that that's, uh, you know, as, as time goes on, you have less and less time to actually spend doing the things that you love. And you don't need to have the interference from other people with, uh, quite frankly, their bullshit that really amounts to nothing. Uh, it's just a continuance of, of them not being able to get their collective shit together. So that song meant an awful lot. The production, <laughs> I really like the production on that. Um, it's one of two songs that uh, Donnie Satterwhite plays on there. I got a chance to use my lap steel. Donnie's performance is, is absolutely wonderful. Uh, but I wanted to have a lap steel, um, you know, uh, pedal steel uh uh, which Donnie plays so brilliantly on that. I uh, wanted to have that there. But also the vocals, I, I really enjoy doing. There are two vocal passages. There's uh, oohs and there's ahs. And uh, I actually, this is kind of interesting. I actually sent uh, a, a rough track of this song to a friend of mine who's who we've sung with before. And I said, look, man, you want to put a guitar part on it? Think about it. But, you know, our voices have always sounded really, really good together Why? because his his voice is higher. Than, than Tony and Mines. I said, why don't you think about putting a, a third harmony in there and we'll, you know, um, we'll, you know, we'll put it together and it'll, it'll sound great. I sent him the song and I never heard back from him. I mean, I tried calling, I tried texting, I tried you know, emailing, everything, nothing. You know, it's like crickets. So I said, well, he's just not interested. Something pissed him off or whatever. The bottom line is, is that I wanted to be three-part harmony. So what I did was it because neither Tony or I had that really high higher voice, I kept the harmonies low. In other words, in the lower range, instead of having like you know alto and and soprano and maybe a little tenor, it was basically you know tenor and alto and maybe you know high alto kind of thing. There's no real high voice in there, and but it made for a wonderful low end kind of rich harmony thing going on, which I grew more and more appreciative of as the times went on, as I started to mix it down. So that song in and of itself really um, kind of came about through, uh, the lyrics came about through personal experience, but the engineering came about through, well, how I had my my mind set on, on you know, it being this way, but uh, that didn't work out, so I'll do it this way. And man, it, it came out sounding absolutely fabulous. So I was very happy with the way that turned out. Sweet. I know I you you answered some questions that I was going to ask you, but the lap steel tone I really liked, and what I really noticed about it was I felt like you used a chorus or a flanger or something to widen the tone. Is that true? Or and if it's not, what did you use? What kind of effects did you use on a lap steel? No, I I used a little bit of chorus on there, uh, just just to give it. Uh, um, 
uh, to fill it out a little bit because basically I wanted, I thought that using chorus would be the best thing that I could do to um, to have it work really well with a pedal steel. Uh, the idea was, uh, you know, uh, to to have a lap steel and a pedal steel playing together. Uh, I had never really heard that before, uh, at least not you know consciously with, with somebody having that in mind when they went into the recording. So I had the had the lap steel in one channel, uh, the the pedal steel in the other, and uh, uh, basically it it ended up being absolutely wonderful. Donnie came in and just 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 hit it out of the park. I mean, he has a nice lead in there, but also uh, between those two parts blending with each other and accenting each other and the vocals coming in, that really was the icing on top of the cake. Uh, I was putting there, uh, there's an ooh part in there that is done during the instrumental part. And I had it in all four, you know, all four parts of the verse. And uh, Tony listened to it and said, you know, I really like those oohs, but maybe I think it's a little bit too much. Can you back off on them a little bit? So I said, well, you know, you actually have a pretty good point there. What I'll do is I'll use the ooze in the last two parts of of, of, the, of each verse and in the last part of the instrumental in the end. So basically you get the instruments, uh, you know, and their their collaboration up front, and then the ooze come in and sweeten the pot, you know, toward the end of it. After everybody's into that, here's a little something extra just to, just to you know, to trip your trigger. And it worked out absolutely beautifully. So, you know, I listened to Tanya. She's got a good ear and she had a good idea about what that song needed it it was perfect you know so it worked out great and the vocal performance that you had i thought it was really really good but i thought it was how do you say i thought it was um craft work and i want to know how you did it because every vocal going into the chorus that you did it really trailed off in a really nice way and i wonder I said, is he backing off the mic or is he using like a, a fade at the end of the file to make it do that? Because I noticed I noticed it right away and it's just like it kept happening. And I was like, did he do this on purpose? It really sounded really good because the song itself has a lot of softness in it where the transients aren't, even though you have all of these string, you have all of these stringed instruments like the lap steel and the pedal steel, they can be transient heavy. That's true. They can, especially if you don't compress them. And I know you didn't. And it's just like I, you know, on the vocal is, you know, along with the instrumental and all that, it had a soft feel to it. And I wondered, like at the the last word you would say or sing at the end of a verse, you know, I felt like you were performing with the microphone to kind of have it trail off a little bit, or did you just use a fade? Which one was it? Or am I just completely wrong? No, you're not completely wrong. Uh, there was a, a certain amount of fade use in that, uh, but the interesting thing was is that I did the three parts myself and got them to where I was comfortable with the way that they sounded. But also at, at the end, it had I wanted, you know, there was one particular part of the vocal which I, I really I sang and I wasn't out of pitch or anything like that or out of time, but it just didn't feel as full as the other two. It was kind of like the one in the middle, and I wanted it to stick out a little bit simply because. I wanted it to have like a little bit of, uh, I don't know, old style Beatles soft harmony kind of thing going on. So I went to my bag of tricks and I have uh, some um, some vocal loops that are Oz. Okay, and so basically uh, the the last little little section, the, at the actually the last note that is held out really really long at the end of the ah part, mm-hmm. which which you can actually hear in the in the and the trailing out of the song, it, it's just, it doesn't have any vocals in there. It just has the the background harmony, and you can hear how really nice that 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 uh, that formulates there. But um, at the end of the day, I, I use that just to bump that up just a little bit, just so it can have more presence, and it worked out great. So yeah, there 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 was uh, there was a, a fading uh, that was you know utilized, but there was also just a little something to uh, to give me a, the actual real feel that I wanted. I hear you. Because like I said before, man, the, the, you know, the string instrument tone was really good together as an ensemble. And I was like, wow, that really sounds good. It's wide, but it's straight up the middle sort of without getting in, in the way of vocal. Understood. Uh, and plus I, I really like the, uh, the rhythm section, the, the bass, the drums and uh, the acoustic guitar. 
uh, they provide a really, really good uh, uh, rhythm section. Uh, I did the loops on on the uh, on the drums. David Mills played the bass. I love every once in a while when I go back, I'll just listen to David because he is such a tasty bass player. Uh, he was a bass player on Free Me. He was a bass player on but you know Before You Go. I mean, uh, the man is is just masterful of what he does. So uh, you know there were there were good people on that track. There's no doubt about it. But those instruments uh, blended so well together. And I had listened to Donnie for years, and and I've been into my lap steel for quite a bit for, uh, uh, you know, the last, well, since I've had it. And I always thought that, you know, that they could be played uh, on the same track and could accent each other really, really well. Um, Just like at the end track uh, with the I'll Remember instrumental, Stevie Strings and the pedal steel are just so incredible together. They, uh, you know, those guys just, they blow me away. So, but I, I really felt like uh, that, that's something I wanted to do with Donnie, and uh, and it worked out great. I was very very happy with with how that turned out. It don't mean nothing When you think of the places we have seen It don't mean nothing If you can't make it in between I've been thinking a lot Enjoying the fact
Devil's Dream came about in a jam. Yes, it did. And I remember how excited you were about that happy accident. Oh, yeah. Because <laughs> I remember it was like you did it the one day and it was just like this this thing that just happened. And you got it recorded and all that. And then you called me the next day to, to tell me about it. And I was like, OK. So when I heard it, I was like, OK, this is serious. I understand. So. I can't really ask you what inspired it, because, again, it was a happy accident. You guys were working on some other things. You were, you know, just, you know, hanging out and uh, doing, you know, recording some stuff. And it just happened to happen. That's right. But after the fact, once you got the basic idea down, what was the thought? You know, did it, you know, did it evolve or did you leave it the way it was? It's exactly as performed. I mean, live in color, one time, four guys who who got together in Bob's studio. We were doing something and we got together in Bob's studio and uh, basically Bob and Greg were fooling around with it. Um, uh, you know, uh, the, he had set up a, a blue, Bob was really, he had a bluegrass band. And he was into, you know, setting up the old style bluegrass thing, put a couple of stereo mics in front of you and people step in to do their thing, you know, when they, whenever they want to take a lead or something along those lines. Uh, he had gotten that pretty much down pat. And he was at, in the studio fooling around with it with Greg with the lead parts and uh, uh, Shay Roebuck and I just kind of stepped in. Um, like I said in, in an earlier thing, I, I had never uh, heard the song before. And the four of us had never played the song before, but we had all played together before. And so it was like, okay, one, two, three, those guys started off and Shay and I just kind of came in with, with what we felt like was appropriate. And it just, it, we had so much fun doing that. And of course, Bob got the recording, sent us an MP3 and I re-engineered it, you know, 10 or 15 years later to something that uh, uh, I felt like could be a, a better representation of, of that moment but also of our of our acoustic skills, uh, which is a, a real big theme in this album is is acoustic, uh, except for uh, uh, say you will. So at the end of the day, um, that was uh, that was uh, just a magic moment, magic studio moment that uh, that just happened uh, between four good buddies. And to tell you the truth, um, we haven't gotten together and played since that day and that that particular show since. And I, I miss that. But you know, they're all still playing. But uh, at the end of the day, um, it uh, it was just something really special, and it's always been special. And uh, uh, when I put the album out, uh, the, the 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 track that people responded to initially the most was that one, because it has, uh, you know, it starts off with two guitars, and all of a sudden it just fills, you know, your speakers with sound when when Shay and I kick in, and it's that way all the way to the end. So uh, it's a special piece, but it was done by four guys who I think knew what they were doing. Truth. How many takes did y'all, you know, how many takes were required or was it just that one run? One, just that one run. Wow. Let's just do this. You know, that's what <laughs> made it so special. That's what, you know, I sit back and I remember that moment. I, I remember us staying there doing it and it was just, <laughs> you know, it's a great memory, but it's also a great performance on the fact of everybody, everybody in there really, you know, and, and we communicated with each other, even though we'd never had the time to rehearse, we communicated really well. There's a section in there where, go, where, where the acoustic guitar goes, dun, 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 those little high notes in the first part. Shay on his bass repeated those high notes in his bass part in the exact same spot the next time around. So it's almost like everybody's listening really closely. Everybody's enjoying it, but everybody realizes what it takes to actually make that song something special. So, you know, it was... You know, it was just, it was just a whole lot of fun. <laughs> I could tell. I could tell. Yeah, you know. Now, you said you took the original track, and years later, you remixed it. He sent us he sent us all an MP3, so, you know, he turned the tape deck on, but he didn't really get into mixing it down all that much. He got a nice uh, balance and stuff. Sent us all an MP3 so we could remember it. But I believe that I could take that MP3 and engineer it, uh, put it on uh, several different uh, tracks in the re in the actual recording, and use EQs and panning to highlight the actual tones of the instruments that were there. That so I could actually create a blend that would be really really nice, you know, in the overall as opposed to just taking what was there. Uh, it, it's more than than what it was simply because uh, I was able to arrange the instruments uh, in, in the space provided. 
and also work with their EQs uh, because, you know, I, I could back off on the high end stuff when I, on the track that I wanted to have the bass uh, be a little bit more dominant, that kind of thing. So I was able to, um, to engineer it. And then once, uh, once I got it uh, engineered, when I mastered it, phew, man, that, that was just the icing on the cake. It mastered really, really well. So I was, I was, I was lucky to be able to do that. Uh, but it was, uh, you know, it was, um, you know, it was a, an engineering experiment that actually ended up, you know, serving, uh, you know, so many different uh, uh, great moments. So, you know, I, that, that I wanted to try that and it worked out. better angels lyrically heavy and what did those lyrics mean to you just in general i mean because there's other questions i have but in general your first thought on what you were thinking when you wrote it i i there are some times when i'll i'll wake up and i'll watch the news um i i don't try and watch too much news i'll watch news maybe for about a half an hour maybe an hour in the morning and that's it. I'll cruise, uh, you know, different publications and stuff like that uh, during the course of the day sometimes. But there are, there are incidents that happen in on the news that I just, I just sit back and cry because, I mean, you know, uh, they're, they're, some of it's a human, uh, I guess you could say, uh, the cause is totally human. Other, it's like natural disasters. There's all kinds of things that happen. But at the end of the day, you know, there's so much, you know, emphasis on politics and race and things of this nature. But actually, to me, uh, the thing that's most important is, is to concentrate on our virtues, the things that, make, that bring out the good part in us, uh, honor, courage, uh, fairness, love, uh, humanity. I mean, you know, um, just kindness. You know, where did they go? Uh, it, it, most people will sit back and think about, this is what, this is what my parents taught me. You know, whether it was trying to do it through church or through their own particular, uh, you know, uh, characters and, and their experiences. Uh, you know, how did people ever get to the point of hating so much? You know, uh, and to translate that, well, now we're seeing it, you know, with, with gun violence and stuff, to translate that in a way that is so totally negative when it's so easy to be, uh, you know, to be kind, to look, look at a person, see their situation, help them if you can, you know, at least, you know, do something that will, will not, you know, make the, the load heavier, uh, make the load a little bit lighter. Uh, and the thing is, is that you'll feel good doing it. You know, you will, 
But so many people have just lost that. It's been lost in society. It's been lost in the churches. I mean, you know, to me, uh, they're losing membership, and I understand why. Because at the end of the day, they are not preaching, you know, honor, courage, uh, fairness, love, kindness, you know. Uh, they're not teaching that anymore. At least I'm not seeing it. If they're teaching it, the words might be there, but the actions certainly are not translating into something that we want to see on the news. That's for sure. I hear you. It's deep. It's deep. I um, I listen to it closely. Um, and actually, you know, when you mentioned um, the lessons that our mothers and fathers taught us, um, I know from my experience, some of those lessons will always translate, but then some of them change. Some of them That's were true. actually wrong. How do you how do you reconcile when there are flaws on either side or both? Well, well, for an example, my parents grew up in a very small town, uh, Canova, West Virginia, at the intersection of Kentucky, Ohio, and West Virginia. You know, uh, the Ohio River and the Big Sandy and floods and all the rest of that kind of stuff. They grew up in a town that did not have a single black person in it. That's that They grew up as kids all the way to when my dad uh, went off in the Navy and my mom went off to San Francisco to, you know, she spread her wings a little bit to, to work. They had no experience whatsoever. Um, so, but the thing is, they also, uh, there, was, there was nothing for them to teach me about how to interact with these people. But they did teach me how to respect people and to treat them kindly and to, and to, uh, to not, uh, you know, uh, make people feel terrible with something that you do or something that you say. Or, or to, to act, react violently to something that, that really doesn't call for a violent reaction, uh, they taught me, you know, th- to be good to other people. So no matter what they were, where they were coming from or what experiences that they had, you know, they, all, anything that, that, would, uh, that would point toward uh, all these negative tendencies that people have uh, would, would not really be manifested in, in the way that I would react to them because they taught me to react to them differently. He said, you know, you know, and at the time, you know, my mom taught Sunday school, that kind of thing. Those kinds of lessons, you know, vacation Bible school and all the rest of that kind of stuff, those kinds of lessons were simple, but they were all focused on, you know, uh, uh, just trying to be a good human being and not be a total asshole, you know, uh, even when times get absolutely terrible. Um so no matter what they, they might have brought to me, brought to the table because of their experience of small time living in, in West Virginia, there was nothing there that would say that I should look or feel or think any differently about uh, another human being, except for the fact that they're just like me. They're another human being. And, I, you know, I, I look at them and I, I praise them for that because, you know, it's the right thing to do as a parent. Uh, and uh, those are the those lessons and those attitudes have served me well my entire life. Yes, sir. They have. That's a deep answer. <laughs> like I said, man. Um, certain things change. Some things they don't they change. Do. Some people. You like I said, in my own life. And you look back and go, well, I don't know about that. <laughs> and then some some things are just ironclad. They it's just like you can't put a hole in it because That's right. it's a truth. That's right. No matter where you go, it translates. It just, you know, it doesn't fall apart if it goes to another region of the country or the world or what have you, or time. It just is what it is. And so, you know. Well, another aspect of that particular song, uh, it is simplistic. I mean, it's just me and an acoustic guitar with, with a, some background uh, ooze uh, at the, at the, in the transitional part. Uh, you made that song happen. Uh, I had it. You came over. It was our first chance to actually really have a formal session together. And, uh, man, it was was great. I mean, there were everything. I mean, I put the ooze in later on uh, because, you know, I didn't need somebody at the board to do that for me. But the guitars, we you brought over your mics. We experimented. I I wanted a powerful guitar sound. Not that the the Guild F50 Jumbo had delivered that, but it's delivered it in so many different ways, whether it be strumming or finger picking. And that was one of the most powerful rhythm parts I've ever played. Simple, but still very, very powerful. And it needed to be captured. You did that. That was a good time, man. That was a good time. It was. 
They we really were. More of that shit going on. Yes, sir. <laughs> yes, sir. Um, again, heavy song. The lyrics really are the strongest part of it to me because, again, it's one thing to have a great instrumental. I'm not saying that, that it's not powerful, but what I am saying is when people can express their thoughts honestly. I mean, we said that in the last episode, you know, about a tune, you know, no matter how dark it was, it, was, it wasn't a lie. That's right. It wasn't hyperbole either. It was just what it was. And this is one of those songs. You know, I, when I listen to it, I'm like, boy, that's a deep song right there. So well, one of the nice things about it is that um there is some depth to it but it's, there's also simplicity to it. Why do people have to make things so hard and so complex when it really uh you, you know you don't have to be an asshole when you when you're involved in different situations no matter what. I mean there's always a there's always a protocol that can lead you to a better place. Uh, but you know, it takes a, it takes a moment to step back. It takes it takes emotional maturity, which I find at a at a, at a very very it's lacking a lot in society. Emotional maturity about just how to deal with other people. Uh, so I mean, you know, um, it's not that hard to do. It's not that hard to be kind. It's not that hard. It just like in the old days, it's as easy as opening a door, you know, for somebody. Uh, it's a small thing, but it makes a difference, you know, and just speaking, speaking uh, to people in, in the right tones and, and, and talking about topics, you know, that are, that are meaningful. Um, uh, to this day, I don't know why, how we evolved into this, you know, politics is everything. I can remember the fact where I, you know, I treasured, you know, the fact that nobody knew who I voted for. I never told my kids in school who I voted for ever, ever. I mean, there wasn't a single political opinion that I put out there. I would listen to their opinions, and I would be the devil's advocate, and I would do that to to uh, help them engage in, in more uh, meaningful discussions. But they never. They would ask me. I say, "What do you think?" <laughs> and they, you know, and they would they would tell me. But I never told them that I either voted, you know, Republican or Democrat. I didn't or independent. Never told them that because I felt like that would be something that would really limit. Or, or possibly hinder them from speaking their minds or for participating in class in something that could be really, really challenging and really, really good for all of us. So why we've gone down that road, I don't know. But we need to get away from that stuff and start talking about, you know, things of substance because politics to me is a, you know, there's more bullshit in there than I can even think about. Honor and courage, fairness and love Just what else should we all be thinking of? Care for each other, sister and brother All the lessons from my father and my mother I give all that I can Trying hard to understand As time goes by I can hear them cry Asking why, 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 why Waiting for our better angels I can hear them cry 
asking why, 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 and hoping our better angels will arrive. Say you will. I kind of laughed. <laughs> yeah. Because I was like, is some woman jerking his chain? What in the world's going on with this one? Now, before we get into inspiration, I want to talk about it musically. Who played guitar? Greg, that, that was another Tom and Greg uh, duo studio duet thing. He played the electric rhythm and he played the electric lead. And he turned and burned, incredible. buddy. Turned yeah, and man. burned. I was like, I thought it might have been Greg because you got to get used to his excellence. And, you know, feel I feel like the relationship y'all have, you probably called him. But I wasn't sure and I didn't want to presume. But so I wanted well, I, to ask. No, he he did a great job. He he, he brought his guitar. And it was really neat about that particular session was that uh, his soon-to-be uh, wife, Maggie, was in the room with us. So was Tanya. And uh, so, you know, he played three different tracks. He did one uh, with distortion on it through my uh, my rat. He did one uh, that was clean. And he did one uh, through a, a phase shifter, which I really didn't use all that much. I used the distortion one a lot. Uh, and I also used the the clean one. I added a flange to it. Uh, on the on the first lead that he does uh, before the second verse comes in, the very last part is a uh, is uh, it's the clean guitar which I added a flange to, and it, it came out sounding absolutely awesome. But Greg, Greg just hit that one uh, out of the park. I mean, I I knew what he would be able to do. It was just a matter of getting him in there and doing it. it took It took us forever. COVID just really screwed around with this. That's why it took so long to get this one out. But um, yeah, Greg, uh, his his rhythm part. Uh, it's just it's just sexy. It's got balls. He, he he picks up on the exact right tempo and licks and stuff like that for the rhythm. And his lead just it's incredible. It really is. It, he does such good work on that. Um, the interesting the, the vocal part was it was developed in a really really weird way. Uh, when I did the song and I wanted to put a scratch vocal on it, I only had one verse written, and that's the first verse. So what I did was, in order to be able to give the song its composition, I sang the the same verse, the first verse, and the, where the second verse is, just so I could I could give it to people and and you know give it to Greg, and uh, you know he'd have something to go by. But what happened was, you know, and, and you know the first one says, uh, um, uh, it, it talks about it, I, you, I can hear that you're teasing me. Well, the second verse says I can hear that you're cheating me. Uh, and the first said, uh, first verse is that you want me, and the second verse is that you love me. Well, what I did was when I when I put the second verse on, I took the the first verse and I completely you know muted it, and then I added the second verse to it, you know, just on a separate track. What I didn't know, <laughs> but you're not being so cool. What I didn't know was that I had practiced that singing that so much that the actual syllabic rhythm of it. Was it the, of the second verse was exactly the same as the first, so I didn't hear myself singing that first verse. I didn't sing along to that. I just sang the second verse. But then when I went back to mix it, I brought that first verse up, and it's almost like I put some kind of vocal effect on there, which I didn't. It's just me singing those two parts that are that are so close, you know, as far as the way that they're sung. Except one one says. Uh, you say that you love. Uh, you say that you love me, but uh, but then you walk away. And it says, uh, "I feel like you're cheating." Uh, could it be that you're cheating, like other people say? Well, the cheating went along with the teasing, and uh, I, I always thought that this was kind of because it created a new word. The new word is cheesing, because I put the second verse up a little bit more, so it got the got the teasing in there, but it got the ch from the cheating, and it's cheesing. So if you're cheating and and teasing and cheating somebody, you're cheesing them. So I created a new word. I, I just I, every time I listen to it, I get a big kick out of that. I know it's just me, and I'm, I'm a geek. But the bottom line is, is that that was a little thing that I thought was really pretty cool because both of the vocals being actually sung, uh, you know, uh, they they're so close, but they're different enough to where it, it gives like a really different vocal effect. Plus, I was able to engineer them a little bit differently because there was two tracks to work with. So, um, yeah, I really enjoyed doing the vocal uh, engineering on that. Uh, and the performance of the vocals on that, because that that was just a little fun moment that I just discovered just kind of happened, you know, 
out of the blue. So that's weird. Nice. So what was the inspiration, man? Tell us uh, the story. Well, I have a friend uh, who was going through divorce and, uh, you know, a woman uh, who basically, you know, uh, uh, she tried the best she could, you know, to, to you know, to, to make things right with her and her husband. But, you know, um, uh, I can see that you're teasing. Uh, could it be that you're teasing like all the other people say? Could it be that you're cheating like all the other people say, both of which were true? So, uh, you know, she was going through a lot. Eventually, she got her divorce and all the rest of that stuff. But I was thinking about that. You know, I wanted to keep it simple because the music to me was the thing that that really sold it. But also, it was a different way of me singing it. I was, you know, uh, more talking the verses than I was singing them. And I don't usually do that a lot, but I wanted to do it on this one because it just seemed to fit right. And it was also a lower register kind of thing. It, a, a higher voice than that would, would have just not fit. So talking it low really worked out really well. And, and it, you know, the story itself was, was just taken from a person who tried and, and couldn't keep it together. Got it. Because, like, when you're, you're talking it, but between the music and the progression that was chosen and the way you were talking, it's really angry. Yeah. And that's why I was like, somebody <laughs> jerking this dude's chain? He is not having time for this. So no, that's I, why I wanted to ask. Yeah, I think having the voice in the lower register gives it that, you know, sense of, you know, anger or evil or whatever the case might be. Uh, you know, it's uh, it, it's all a matter of interpretation. But, yeah, uh, there's there was nothing really good that happened until that divorce was final for the for these people. Uh, but they both seem to be doing pretty well and it's they're better off without each other. I know that much. I've been trying to remember A moment when you didn't lie It doesn't seem to matter much Even when I try and try You could say that you want me But then you walk away Can it be that you're teasing Like all the other people say Take a look around, take a look around Do you see somebody else? I'm starting my life over Do something for yourself Say you will Say you won't I've never heard you say That you don't say you will Say you won't I've never heard you say That you don't say you will Say you won't I've never heard you say That you don't say you will Say you won't
Okay. Okay. Well, if I could, um, another collab between you and Steve Gallagher. Yep. Your guy. Tell us the inspiration behind the tune. Because we all know where Steve's coming from. So let us know in particular what these lyrics were about. Well, I think it's about finding God, about finding, uh, you know, the truth, uh, uh, you know, that can be found in a spiritual situation. Um, <laughs> you know, it took us years to finish that song. But doesn't it always? Yes, it does. Uh, but it was worth it. I, you know, I, 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 I graduate. It was definitely worth it. Um, Stevie has, uh, um, well, it, it, first of all, it, it was a, also a really, really good performance on his part. The only thing I did on that on that was engineer it, uh, and uh, at least uh, did the mixing and the mastering. He did a lot of the tracks at his at his studio at home. He recorded me doing a six string uh, uh, finger picking uh, acoustic thing. He did everything else: twelve string acoustic finger picking. You know, everything. Uh, uh, you know, the flute, the whole nine yards. So at the end of the day, it's a really, really good testament to uh, his ability uh, to not only you know to write good lyrics and and to sing. It, this is one of the best vocal performances he ever gave. If you listen to the last part of the second verse. It is so sweet the way his voice sounds, mm -hmm. uh, uh, and he caught that really, really well. Uh, and he did that at home. I didn't do it here, uh, so I was very, very pleased. He sent me some good stuff. That was one of the things that he he changed a lot. Uh, the middle part we worked on an awful lot. It, it what the song started out being is nothing the way it ended up, but the way it ended up was was just magnificent, especially. You know the way his string parts actually worked out. Uh, I was very, very pleased. Uh, you know, to have that kind of that kind of grist for the mill to engineer that, he gave me some really good stuff, uh, some actual brilliant transition stuff uh, for me to work with, and uh, the ending of it, the way that it actually, you know, uh, the strings actually introduce themselves and, and fade out as the song goes on. It's a it's a brilliant tune, and as far as the lyrics are concerned, um, um, I think I think that basically it's his his way of saying. That you know, in order to be able to find a true spiritual self, sometimes life gets in the way. Uh, and uh, uh, if if I could ever you know lose myself, I would find you. In other words, you ha if you're going to find God, sometimes you have to give up yourself in order to be able to to understand exactly what that happens to be all about. Um, uh, you know, there, there's a lot of meaning in. in um, uh, and the things that he sees as being uh, the right way to go through spirituality, uh, what you're holding on to and what you should let go of, uh, just just things in life that actually, uh, um, uh, you know, give him, I guess you could say, a sense of, you know, uh, what being spiritual is all about and leading a good life. You did. You, that's a great answer. Because when I listened to well, it initially, <laughs> well, it, was. it really was. Because I mean, if you if you haven't heard it, which you will, but if you haven't heard it, it you get a sense of what it, you're going to experience when you hear it. That's right. It was done well. I mean, again, it took a long time, but he never puts out anything bad. So I'm like, okay. Oh uh, yeah, we're uh, he wants to, he wants to do an EP of his own. He's he's got uh, he's working on stuff right now. Uh, he's uh, his job keeps him busy uh, all the time, but uh, at the end of the day, uh, he's got some time where he'll be able to devote to it. So he's going to be sending me stuff to mix down and master, and I'm looking forward to that a lot. You and me both. You and me both. It ought to be good. It ought to be good. Oh, yeah. Good songs. Thoughts and dreams that blind me If I could ever stop this rain I would give to you all that
seems to me I keep holding on to the burdens of this life. Why can't I trust them all to you? To the only one who can turn darkness into light. To the one who is faithful and true. If I could overcome this world, I would find thee. If I could overcome my fear that binds me. If I could ever stop this rain, I would hear your voice calling my name. Now, the last song on the path taken was an instrumental of a song that you had already released on uh, Fence in the Sun. Well, it's that's Fence right. by the Sun. And I was, I also, ch- huh? Also released it on the live album. That's right. That's right. Because a lot of that was on that too. So, yeah. That's right. So, I was curious. I mean, I've heard it before. It's a great tune. And I've heard it before. And I was like, what was the inspiration? To make it an instrumental, why would you put that on this collection of songs? Well, twofold. Um, we did that live uh, at uh, the Steel Pier Cafe. Uh, it came out absolutely stellar. Um, it was just me on vocals and finger picking guitar, Donnie Satterwhite on pedal steel, and Pete Schoner on percussion. Uh, but it, you know, that was just one of those one take moments. We we did not practice that song. Uh, they, they, I send them copies of it. They knew what it was. But it's just the three of us said, Donnie had never. I said, Donnie, you want to send it on this? He said, Sure. So so basically, Pete and I did the. You know, he was on the original recording. It was just the two of us on on by the fence in the sun. You know, doing all the parts. Uh, but Donnie, you know, added that flavor, that pedal steel beauty atmosphere thing that he does. He's just. He slays me. He does. He always has and always will. So I thought to myself, you know, um, uh, I would really like to have a polished studio version of that. You know, um, I think that would be really, really good. But then Stevie said, you know, have you, we were talking about, you know, this, that, and the other. He said, have you ever thought about, did you ever think about adding strings to that when you were when you were actually doing it on by the fence? And so I said, yeah, but I, I also wanted it to be something special between me and Pete because on the by the fence of the sun, it's just Pete and I uh, on that song, which makes it very, very special to me and to him as well. Uh, so, um, so he said, "Well, you know, I'd like to, I'd like to put some string parts to that." I said, "Okay." So I sent Stevie the basic, you know, the original by the fence of the sun uh, percussion and um, uh, acoustic guitar tracks. No vocals, no nothing, just those tracks. And so he worked on it for a month or two or something like that. And he said, well, I got something for you. He sent it back, and I was just stunned. I was just stunned. He, I, I said, he said, what do you want me to do if I do this? I said, make him cry. If that's what you want to do. You want to make him cry. You know, you want to pull that emotion out of them. And I heard it, and I just, you know, it just floored me. It was just so good. And I thought to myself, you know, I have never, ever, heard a an up close and personal um 
performance with uh, a string quartet and a pedal steel guitar. Never heard that. Um, and I, you know, I got Steve and I got Donnie. I said, I said I'm not going to be able to get these guys in the studio because Steve's already done his string parts. But if I could get Donnie to come in and put his pedal steel, you know, and to, to, to arrange it to where both of them have a chance to shine, but also when, when they come together, uh, those moments would just be magical as far as how they would, would actually, you know, how the two sounds of those instruments would, uh, or those two musical parts would, would blend together. I thought it could be something special, but man, between COVID and his job and traveling and all this stuff, Donnie, and plus he was playing, he still does, he playing with a group called the Guava Jam Band. They were all over the place. So every minute of discretionary time that he had was taken up because his job is incredibly demanding. So I said, you know, maybe I ought to, maybe I ought to just, you know, go ahead with that. I said, no. I said, this Donnie thing, you know, I want Donnie on this. I, th- th- he's got to be on this. So he came over uh, shortly before I, I published the album and put the, the two tracks on for This Is The Place and, and I'll Remember The Instrumental. And I was just floored. You know, I, I knew when he was doing it, I knew what how, you know, because he did his thing. He did about, you know, three or four tracks. And uh, just to make sure that he he got in, you know, not only lead licks, but also some atmospheric stuff. He does that. We do that together as part of what we do. And he he he, he says, you know, I'm sure I've given you enough to work with. Uh, you, you can work your magic. And so um, he did give you enough to work with. And between those string parts, which, you know, they were not in the same room doing this. Steve had done those string parts at least a year, 18 months before Donnie ever had a chance to sit in there and do something, you know, to play along with them. It just shows how creative and beautiful Steve could be with strings, but also how Donnie can be aware of, of that musical moment and that musical sound and be able to blend, you know, his, his sound with the overall, you know, um, string quartet lead part that, or the you know the melody part and then when he had his chance to shine with his lead to put in something so meaningful and so in touch with what the song was all about whew, man it just i sit back and listen to that song and what i want to remember about something that's what i listen to i don't have any vocals i mean the, there are background little ooze that are in there just as a, as a hopeful transition thing and also at the end they're they're beautiful at the end uh, but, you know, when I want to sit back and just reflect and recall, that's the song I listen to. And um, I hope other people will find it as rewarding as I do as far as uh, the listening thing is concerned. Well, it was a great song. And I'm glad you decided to strip it down and, and repurpose it. it. It fits. I was lucky. Um, I mean, of course, uh, I, I did By the Fence of the Sun at uh, the Cosmopolitan. So I had all the tracks. And I was also able to re-engineer, uh, you know, with a little bit more wisdom and a better skill set. I was able to re-engineer that um, uh, to make uh, not only my acoustic guitar sound better, but also to make Pete stand out more uh, and give Pete some clarity and some real artistic, uh, you know, uh, creative moments, so, which he does with his his cymbals and stuff like that so well. Um, so, yeah, it, it, it was a great engineering um, uh, I guess you could say uh, ex- experience, but also it was a great performing experience. Uh, just uh, just to see those, uh, you know, those people, Stevie and, and Donnie, come in and transform that tune into, into something that is completely new, but also carries the same spirit, you know, because it was written about, you know, my mom and Alzheimer's. It carries that spirit of love and warmth and caring and, um, um, you know, memory. So I feel just really fortunate that all that came together so well.
Well, sir, this is the end. We have completed this particular path. Understood. Any parting shots? Uh, I just want I just want people to know that uh, um, it's hard to put it's hard to put a definition or or an actual explanation on on the uh, the evolution of our relationship and uh, what this podcast actually will mean for me uh, as the years go on. Uh, and hopefully it will mean for other people because at the end of the day, most people don't have any idea of of the uh, the meaning of the songs as, as written by by the author. They don't have any idea about the engineering which you and I both share an interest in, uh, not only the interest but also uh, you know a, a, a professed quality skill set in. Uh, they have no idea uh, my relationship with the players. Uh, you know they they just don't. And this podcast, uh, The Path Taken, allows them to actually, if they want to get into uh, uh, my relationship with other artists, they can. If they want to get into how an album is done, they can. Uh, But, you know, you're an intelligent man, and you've always taken the time to to look and and understand something. And also, from your personal experience, come up with, with questions that are, are meaningful and are not just blase, you know, bullshit that you want to do to take up airtime. Uh, what you what you had to bring to the table was spectacular, and uh, I love you for it, man. I do. Well, sir, uh, again, I want to reiterate what I said at the beginning. Um, it's been a great project. It's it's poignant because the material that you've put together in forty five years. You've done well for a long period of time, and not a lot of people can say that. Now, you have people that can do something for 45 years, but it doesn't mean it was good. It just means they did it. When you find people that have have existed and performed at a high level for a long time, it, it needs to be noted. So in this particular instance, I am glad to be a part of it. And I appreciate you. Um, I haven't done anything that long, that good. And I just appreciate everything that you've done. The effort, the family support, the music, you know, support from musicians, the hard times, uh, the good times, all the, you know, relationships that have died musically, all the relationships you still have. All the things, because if you take one ingredient out, it don't taste the same. You have to have all of it. That's right. So for 45 years, I appreciate your life doing this. And I I am thankful and grateful that you give me the opportunity to sit here with you so you can talk about it so we all know. Because now it's on wax. It's not going anywhere. It'll be here after you or I are gone. That's right. So... From that way, I appreciate it. I love you for it. And it's been a lot of fun. Uh, for the people who have listened to The Path Taken, the people that will listen to these these last two episodes and all the ones that came before it, I want to let you know how much I appreciate y'all listening to it. Um, it's been a great ride. And I appreciate y'all. And uh, signing off from The Path Taken. So thank you. Thank you, brother. Uh, thank you, Tom, and good night. This episode was produced by Tom Farley and Alton Riddick, edited and mixed by Alton Riddick for Edit Your Truth. On behalf of Tom, this is Alton signing off until we meet again on The Path Taken. (music) 